Hi and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Dr. Latrice Montgomery and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Cincinnati. And the purpose of this channel is to discuss marijuana from a scientific perspective. So given that upcoming videos will highlight marijuana research, I thought it would be appropriate to kick things off by discussing the status of marijuana research in the United States. So I often receive questions regarding the pace of marijuana research. So it seems that every day something new is happening related to marijuana, whether it be the legalization of marijuana for recreational or medical purposes in certain states, or the decriminalization or depenalization of marijuana up to certain amounts in certain cities or states. However, when you turn to the research, it seems to lag behind and not be moving as quickly as some of these other areas that I previously mentioned. Why is that the case? So that will be the focus of our time together today the answer to that question is there are several barriers that researchers face when conducting marijuana research. And in particular, I'm talking about research where products are being tested. So you probably have questions regarding THC versus CBD, for example. How effective is CBD? It seems like it's the cure-all for everything. Is it really? We need to be able to do research on those kinds of questions and determine the health effects. What are the good pieces, the bad pieces? We don't know the answers to those questions yet, and so that's why we need the research on it. But in order to conduct that kind of research, there are several steps that researchers have to take. So that's what we'll be covering today. So there are three barriers in particular that I'm going to discuss and highlight. The first barrier is related to regulatory issues. The second is related to financial barriers. And the third is related to study design and methodology issues. So, let's go ahead and jump right in and discuss those in turn. So, as it relates to the regulatory barriers that researchers endure when conducting this research. So, marijuana is considered a Schedule I drug at the federal level. So, what does that mean? Schedule I drugs are drugs that have no currently accepted medical use, they have a high abuse potential, and they have a lack of accepted safety for use under medical supervision. And I'll include a link below that describes the Controlled Substances Act that placed all drugs, narcotics, stimulants, depressants, hallucinogens, anabolic steroids, all of those drugs are placed on schedules. And so I'll include a link below that describes the Controlled Substances Act and where the scheduling process came from. But essentially, the point here is that marijuana is a Schedule One drug. And in order to do research on a Schedule One drug, there are several regulatory pieces that a researcher has to go through before they can actually start their study. So the first step is working with the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration. Now keep in mind the primary mission of the Food and Drug Administration is public health and safety. So they're interested in the safety and effectiveness of drugs, medical devices, and biological products. And so in order to ensure and have their oversight over the process, researchers are required to submit what's called an Investigational New Drug Application, or an IND. And in this application, researchers have to indicate, has this drug been used before, with animals, with humans, what are the safety issues, public health issues, etc. It's a pretty lengthy document, and it's a lot involved, and I'll actually include a link below so that you can take a look at a template of what all is included within this document. And so it takes a while to just get approval from the FDA for that process. So once you get through that, the second step is submitting a letter of authorization or an LOA to the National Institute on Drug Abuse or NIDA. So what this is essentially doing is requesting permission to receive marijuana to use in your study. So currently there's only one federal supplier of marijuana for research purposes in the United States and that is NIDA the University of Mississippi. So a question that I often receive is related to this idea of, well, we have all these dispensaries. Why not just go down the streets to your local dispensary, purchase products from there, bring it back to the lab, have people come in and study its effects? I wish it was that easy, but unfortunately it's not. All research that's conducted on marijuana products, it has, the marijuana has to come from the federal drug supply through NIDA as it stands today. So, that's another barrier that researchers have to overcome. But let's say a researcher gets through that process. The next step 
includes working with the DEA or the Drug Enforcement Administration. Now, the primary mission of the DEA is to prevent the diversion of controlled substances. So they're primarily interested in safety and security as it relates to marijuana. So if you retrieve marijuana for your study, they want to make sure that it's stored properly, that it's secure, and that it only ends up in the hands that it's supposed to be in, and that is the research staff and participants who will be receiving that marijuana. So I mentioned the mission and agenda of these different agencies because they're different than what a research agenda might be. So sometimes it can take a while to kind of go back and forth with agencies to finally get these things approved. And it can take months up to years to do so. So that's just at the federal level. And then once you get to the state level, depending on where the marijuana researcher lives, they may have some additional hurdles to jump through at the state level, such as going to their state board, to get a controlled substances certificate. There are some states that require that. And then at the institutional level, all studies, regardless of what it's focusing on, has to go through an institutional review board or an IRB. And that's to ensure the safety of uh, participants and ethics and making sure that the study is conducted appropriately, et cetera, and that no one is in harm's way. So there are a lot of pieces and a lot of steps that researchers have to go through in order to be able to conduct these kinds of studies. And again, as I mentioned, it can often take months up to years to get this done. And think about all the things that are happening in between time. So that's the primary reason why there's such a lag in what we see with research relative to what's happening in the rest of the world. So the second barrier is related to finances. So the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, is the largest funder of health research in the United States. So most of the marijuana research that you see is funded by NIH, specifically through NIDA that I previously mentioned a few moments ago. Now the primary mission of NIDA is to focus on the causes and consequences of drugs. So traditionally most of their studies have focused on things to prevent and treat drug use and thinking about you know, specific causes, consequences, and not so much the therapeutic effects of certain drugs such as marijuana. So therefore, there haven't been a ton of studies that have, that have came out that have been funded by NIDA that focuses on the therapeutic effects of marijuana. But on the other hand, given that marijuana can potentially cover so many conditions, like for example with medical marijuana, there are so many conditions that people are using it for, whether it be cancer, or HIV AIDS, or PTSD, or anxiety, you name it. And so it might be that it's more appropriate to go through other institutes and centers within NIH to receive that funding rather than NIDA. So researchers are having to get creative about ways to fund the research and also not only just going through NIH but also private funders and other foundations to receive this kind of funding to conduct these studies. But it's also important to note that there's still some stigma related to marijuana. So because of that stigma, oftentimes private funders, foundations may not be as open and willing to fund projects that are hoping to look at potential therapeutic effects of marijuana. So there's still some things to overcome in that area. The third issue is related to um, the study design and methodology. So there are so many pieces here. When you think about alcohol, for example, in the United States, we can all agree on what a standard drink is. So we'll say 12 ounces of beer or five ounces of wine, and we'll call that a standard drink. So when alcohol researchers talk, they can use a common language and they can then communicate to the public what a standard drink does to your body. However, in the marijuana world, we don't necessarily have this standard dosage level. So it's more difficult to say exactly what five joints can do or what five blunts can do to a person because we don't have that standard level um, or standard dosage of marijuana. So that makes it difficult to then synthesize all of the findings that we um, have in our studies and then present it to the public. Another issue with that related to this dosing idea is that there are so many methods of administration with marijuana. Smoking being the most common method, but you can also vape marijuana. There's edibles, there's tinctures, there's oils, patches, lotions, etc. So with so many diverse methods, it makes it difficult, um, again, to kind of come up with what is the standard dosing, um, dosage for marijuana. Or similarly, if I'm conducting a study on heavy marijuana use, the way that I define heavy marijuana use might be very different than the way another researcher defines heavy marijuana use. 
or it may be very different from the way a participant describes their marijuana use. So we have to come up with a standard metric that we can use so that when we communicate our findings, we'll all be on the same page. There's some great work happening in this area, but we're not quite there yet. Another issue is related to the federal drug supply program that I mentioned earlier. So although over the years, the overall quality and potency of the marijuana that's provided by the supply program has improved, Unfortunately, there still does not provide access to products such as edibles and waxes and oils and things like things of that nature. And that's a problem because those products represent the fastest growing segment of the marijuana market. So that means that people are using it at very high rates, but yet we don't know what the health effects of it are because we aren't able to study it in a systematic way. So those are some barriers that need immediate attention. So I've covered a lot, and again, that's not even all of it. So I've included a link below, um, several links below, so that you can take a look at any of these issues in further detail. And of course, if you have follow-up questions, please include those in the comments below. But before I leave you, I do want to leave you with this positive note, because I've talked a lot about the barriers and you know what we need to do to improve. But I do want to say that the world of marijuana research is very exciting and despite these barriers there are people like myself and several of my colleagues who are still working in this area and producing great findings and helping us to get one step closer to answering the questions regarding the health effects of marijuana. So just know that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, there are a lot of barriers. But the great news, as I've mentioned and I've tried to say several times throughout this video, is that there is work being done at the policy level, university level, uh, researcher level, participant level, all great, so many great things are happening. And that's what keeps me going in this area and that's why it's so exciting. And so that will be the primary focus of the rest of our videos is focusing on this research. But I wanted to do this video just to kind of give you some context so you'll know, you know, as we talk about different findings, you'll have a better sense of, of what we're talking about and just the kind of bird's eye view of everything that's going on around us. So I've talked a lot. I've covered a lot of things. And before I leave you, I will say that I know I talk really fast, especially when I get excited about stuff, especially like talking about topics like this marijuana related things so if there are things where I've moved too quickly or you want to learn more please comment down below I will be checking the comments to see what the discussion is and our upcoming videos will be discussing all kinds of stuff related to marijuana I have a long list of things so please 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 like comment subscribe share press that notification bell and I will see you next time where we will discuss all things weed Thank you.